Hi, so today we're going to extend what we've learned about social and cognitive constructivism and talk a little bit more about applications, specifically about the relationship between thought and language and how different theorists in constructivism have thought about the relationship between these two. So our guiding questions today are, does and in which ways does language influence thought? And can thought develop without language? And does our language affect our schema or our understanding of the world? So does language affect our thinking? So thinking about this, so if I say the word sweetbreads versus the word tripe, which one would you rather eat, right? What about if I say a previously owned Toyota versus a used Toyota? Um, or um, this was really explored in the novel 1984 by George Orwell, and he talked about the Ministry of Peace, right, which was really, you know, the, um, the organization, the part of the government that was in charge of the war, right, or the Ministry of Truth, which was really making up lies about the government. So the way in which language affects the way that we perceive the world or the way that we perceive our understanding of something, right? So whether it's, it's food like sweetbreads and tripe or, or a car that we're going to buy or, or even our understanding of the government, right? So um, I think language, you know, does affect our thinking, at, at least to some degree, in how we understand the world. Um, so in thinking about um, in Spanish and then in how across language um, we have different understandings. So in English, we have a different word for the watch and for clock, and, and we might even perceive those as different things, right? That a watch we wear on our wrist versus a clock on the wall um, versus in Spanish, a relo is used for both watch and clock, right? So do they under, just do Spanish speakers perceive those as maybe more similar, right? Um, or dedos, um, which are both fingers and toes, although we we have different words for fingers and toes. So does that distinction make a difference for how we perceive those or not? I mean, I don't think anyone in Spanish gets confused about what are fingers and what are toes, right? We, I'm pretty sure they know the difference, right? It's all about context. So, so having a different word for those, um, does it change their perception? Um, maybe not. Um, and then um, if we, if language is thought and language does affect our thought, um, what about before we develop thought, before we develop language, what about babies? Um, are, are babies capable of thinking if they don't have words yet? So um, before the age of one, before they know mommy and daddy, do they understand who mom and dad are if they don't know the word mom and dad? Um, I mean, I think there might be some evidence that they do, or, or I mean, other people would argue that they don't, right? So these are the questions that we're going to be considering in this lecture today. So language as an expression of cognition. So in Piaget's developmental theory, um, he believed that cognition develops um, as a child's non-linguistic non interactions with the world, um, and that cognition was really separate from language, so that we could develop our understanding of the world um, separately from understanding of language and of the words that describe the world. We could understand gravity without knowing the word gravity, right? That we can understand that a spoon's always going to fall to the floor, right? That we can understand um, about fluffy animals without knowing about cats and dogs. On the other hand, on the other extreme, is um, Jerry Fodor's um, language of thought, and that people think in, in what he called mentalese, or the language of thoughts, the that thoughts have their own language, um, and that language is mapping concepts to a target language. So thinking that we, that mentalese is this language within our brains, and that then we develop the words that we can match these concepts to. Um, and then the, the Worthian hypothesis, um, linguistic determinism, is the idea that language shapes thought, that language, which includes both words and grammar, that is both words and how we put them together, um, shape how we think and how we organize what we know. Um, so that without language, um, the language really determines how we perceive the world and, and what we can even know about the world. Um, so if we think about this, um, in English, we have words for red, orange, yellow, blue, green, violet, right? We have, and lots of colors in between, right? But those are the, you know, basic words. Um, in African language Shona, 
um, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. So that there are that red orange is, is one color. So they don't distinguish between those two colors um, in their language. Um, and then in African Basa, um, red, orange, and green, blue, violet are are, are only two words, right? So the like green, blue, violet are, are all, so we essentially have warm color and a cool color um, in our, um, so that, um, that, but then people from all colors could distinguish between colors in the spectrum. So it wasn't that they couldn't tell the difference between red and orange just because they didn't have a word for it. Um, but then some other tests show that in English we were quicker and maybe faster and better at distinguishing between red and orange than people who didn't have a separate word for it. Um, but they still could make that distinction. So, um, you know, we're, we're a little bit, um, the language makes a difference, but maybe not a deterministic difference, perhaps, in, in what we know about language and color. Um, tandem development. So the idea that concepts and language develop together, and this is based upon this constructivist idea, um, that learning about the world and concepts go hand in hand with language. So that, remember my, my example with the cat and the dog and the furry animals, and that, that I, I could distinguish between the cat and the dog because I learned the words for cat and dog. And so now I could develop schema around cats and dogs because I had a word for it. So language, and concepts developed together. Um, so some empirical evidence, um, the idea of object permanence. This is this idea that um, just because an object disappears from view doesn't mean that the object has disappeared from the world, um, but it's just gone from view, That's a, but it still exists. That's the idea of object permanence. The babies develop, right, in their developmental timeline. Um, and the word gone to express that idea of object permanence um, develops at the same time um, that they, they, kids get that um, developmental understanding of object permanence. Um, same with like this idea of, is that a maple? Is that a tree? And um, we might just classify it as a tree, but as soon as we know the word maple, then we start thinking of that tree as a maple, not just as a tree once we learn the word for something, then we can also further classify it. So we have some empirical evidence about how language um, develops with our conceptual understanding. And I think we might also um, be able to understand this. Have you ever learned a new word and then all of a sudden been able to recognize a new concept? So that without, under, without learning that word, you didn't really know that concept before. Um, so it's, it's really interesting. And, and we can probably think of examples of the opposite, where we knew about a concept, but, until, but then we learned the word for it later. So it's not clear the relationship between language and conceptual understanding, right? Um, then thinking for thinking. Um, this idea, the distinction between non-linguistic thought and thinking for speaking. So do you ever have, if we think about our own thinking, we can think about when we are thinking in, in specific words and when we're maybe not. Um, and utterances are a sketch of what we experience and the language shapes what we know. For example, um, the use of gendered pronouns in English. Um, and if you've ever had the experience where you've maybe had a friend um, or an acquaintance who um, may have gone through um, a gender transition um, and you switch genders for them um, conceptually, um, that changes a lot about them and the way that you think about them. Um, and so this thinking for speaking, um, this change in this gendered pronouns um, makes a difference in this. It's a very linguistic thing. It hasn't changed your conception of the person, and yet, and yet it does, right? Um, another example of this is um, this example of um, Frog, Where Are You? It's this picture book, and it has no words. I mean, we ask children from different <laughs> languages, although it tells a story, right? Um, but children's um, explanations of the same story vary greatly depending on what language they use and how they express what happened. So that the culture and the language are, are really tied to each other. Um, 
So we think in the same language that we speak. Um, and you might have experienced this if you've ever learned another language and you get immersed in that language and you start thinking in the other language and it in your second language and it becomes um, an immersive experience, right? Um, Vygotsky um, thought that the basic processes occur without language, but higher processes um, require language, the processes that only happen in humans, um, the reasoning and analysis and, and emotions and feelings, those kinds of things, they require language. Um, so, and some ideas from this, like calculations. So, um, we calculate bills in our native language, and that's is kind of been demonstrated in research, right? Um, that numbers under four we can do in, in any language, uh, but numerical reasoning over four occurs with the language, our native language, our, our language we're most familiar with. And, and our reasoning, there's some really interesting studies with, um, with language and numbers and how those interact. Um, and how the language around numbers. So um, in English, um, 13, 14, 15 don't follow the regular pattern um, that the others do. So 20 is 21, 22, 23 follows a really regular pattern. So we know that, that children in English have a more difficult time with those teen numbers and adding to the base 10 because of our language versus um, languages where that's much easier, much more transparent versus um, I think it's French that's on a really um, difficult base system in their language, right? Um, and so if the French have an even more difficult time um, with arithmetic, there's some evidence of this, right? That um, because their language doesn't support numeracy quite as easily as, as some Asian languages, that that might explain part of the differences we see in early childhood um, in math for, um, math abilities or math achievement in early ages just basically based upon our language, which is kind of interesting because we think in the language of, of we think about numbers in our native language. Um, so modern tests, um, we dissect nature along lines laid down by our native languages. Um, so language helps us organize the world and we do this according to our native language. Um, so some examples um, is um, nouns and verbs and how we how we develop um, our own language. So in Japanese and Korean, there are a lot more verbs that are more frequent and more salient than in English. So verbs are a more important part of that language. And what we find out is that Korean children um, acquire these verbs earlier um, than, um, in, than, in Amer than American children who organize their nouns into categories earlier. So it's, it's interesting how the prevalence of nouns or verbs in a language um, determines the development of those words in the native language. And then gender marking on languages. So genders, um, nouns have gender in other languages, right? And it's lar largely pre pretty arbitrary. So in moon in Spanish is feminine, but moon in German is masculine, right? Um, but we know the moon is neither masculine nor feminine in real life, right? And it's just a rock in the sky. Um, but what we know is that when we asked in English, so we asked native speakers of Spanish and German and English to describe the moon in three words, um, the native Spanish speakers use more feminine words, and native German speakers use more masculine words to describe the moon, and based upon their the gender of the word in their native language. So those gender markings are kind of deep set within the language um, apart from um, our understanding of what the moon actually is, right? So th that's a brief understanding of how language interacts with how we learn and how that's related to particularly social constructivism. So if you have any questions, um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, email is great, and I look forward to seeing y'all later. Bye.